Hello everyone, and welcome to a very special story time in which we will read two stories by Indigenous authors. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that I am a settler on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, and Chippewa peoples. The St. Mary's Public Library is also situated on this traditional territory. I'm sure you've heard a lot in the news lately about a massive tragedy involving the horrific residential schools. Don't be afraid to talk about it with your parents if you're feeling sad. And if you're interested in learning more, we have resources here at the library to help you. Just like the two books I am going to be sharing with you today. Now the first book we are going to read is called When I Was Eight, written by Christy Jordan Fenton and Margaret Pokaik Fenton and art by Gabrielle Grimard. Now, these two names might be familiar to you. The two authors of this book are well known for the books Fatty Legs and A Stranger at Home. Those are adult books. But this story is the same story as Fatty Legs, but it is made accessible to people your age. Now, it is still a very, very serious story but it has a hopeful ending. It helps us see that, yes, some of this is in the past, but some of it is very much in the present. Many of these residential schools were still operating in the last 50 years. And Margaret here, the girl in our story, she is the author of this story. So this story is all about her. And this here is the exact school that she attended. All right, let's hear Margaret's story. I knew many things when I was eight. I knew how to keep the sled dogs quiet while father snuck up on caribou and to bring the team to him after a kill. I knew the sun slept in the winter and woke in the summer. And I knew that when the sun warmed Arctic Ocean shrugged off its slumbering ice, we would cross it to trade furs with the outsiders. But I did not know how to read the outsiders' books. It was not enough to hear them from my older sister, Rosie. I longed to read them for myself. Although I begged like a hungry dog after scraps, father would not let me go to the outsider's school like Rosie. He knew things about the school that I did not, but my name is Olimon, the stubborn stone that sharpens the half-moon ulu knife used by our women. I wore away at him all through the winter, and when the sun awoke again, and we traveled to trade at the outsiders, he reluctantly let me, left me at their school. A black-cloaked nun cut my hair. I felt naked as my braids fell to the floor. Stripped of my warm parka, I was made to wear a thin pinafore and scratchy underwear, with stockings too small to stay above my knees. My Inuit name was taken, and I was to be called Margaret. All I had left was a beautiful book my sister read me about a girl named Alice. I hugged it to my chest and tried to be brave like the girl in the story. Every day for weeks, we woke very early for chores. Instead of sitting in desks, we scrubbed the floor beneath them. We washed walls and dishes and laundry, and then we went to church and kneeled on our already aching knees to clean our souls. I worked hard, but it brought me no closer to being able to read. When the first skiff of snow returned and my hopes were nearly dead, the kindly head nun led us to a classroom and told us to be seated. At last, we were going to read. Behind the teacher's desk sat the nun who had cut my hair. I didn't want her for a teacher, but I sat very tall so she would know I was eager. A few older girls raised their hands, so I did too. The nun laughed and motioned for me to stand and read. Read? I couldn't even speak English. I scowled at her as the others giggled. Instead of learning to read that day, I spent the rest of the class with my nose in the corner and my stocking slouched around my ankles. The nun constantly gave me extra chores as part of my education, she said. But though my muscles ached from the hard work and I could barely keep my eyes open, she could not wear out my determination. I used every task as an opportunity to learn new words. I studied each letter of the alphabet before wiping it from the board. 
I looked at the labels on cleaning supplies and sounded out the words. I even studied the writing beneath pictures in the hall. These things improved my reading, but I longed to read an actual book, my book. One evening, I hurried through my supper of cabbage soup, planning a hasty escape. I couldn't wait any more. I dashed into the hall, but the nun was waiting for me. Not so fast, Margaret. There are pots to be scrubbed, she said in a threatening tone and marched me to the kitchen. With my arms in scalding hot water up to my elbows, I couldn't hold back my frustration. I could be reading, I muttered. What? the nun demanded, her shoes creaking as she crossed the kitchen. She pinned me against the sink. Slowly, a smile spread across her thin lips. Fetch me a cabbage from the basement, she ordered. I would heard stories of children who disappeared down in that dark cavern. I descended each step deliberately hiding my fear. My hands quickly found a cabbage in the shadows, and I scurried up the stairs. But she slammed the door, shutting out all light. I pulled the handle. It was locked. I s a scream built in my chest, but I held it in. I closed my eyes, pulled up my stockings, and breathed deeply until I could feel my father's presence. He wrapped his arms around me in the darkness, and I spelled out my Inuit name to him, whispering, O-L-E-M-A-U-N. His proud smile made me stronger, so I worked through the name of my distant home. B-A-K-B-A-N-K-S-I-S-L-A-N-D. I spelled many things from home and was starting on the title of my book, A L I. When the door opened, I squeezed past the nun and returned to the sink. Her angry black eyes raised goosebumps on the back of my sh shaved neck, but she could not make me cry. When I returned to the dorm room that night, all the girls were giddy. Everyone had beautiful new dark stockings. I pulled off my old ones, took my place in front of the nun, held out my hands, and closed my eyes. The nun cackled loudly as she handed my pair to me. Laughter instantly filled the room. They're, they're red, I stammered in disbelief. Only circus clowns wore red stockings. I ran to my bed and opened my book. I stared at the letters, holding back my tears, until those letters became words which grew into a familiar story. I could almost hear my sister's voice reading about the cruel queen, and I let the story carry me far away from the laughter. The next morning, I crept quietly to breakfast, but an older girl saw me and called out, Fatty legs! as bits of food fell from her mouth. Fatty face! I shouted back, F-A-T-T. -T. The nun swooped in. If you cannot get along with the others, you can tend to the laundry, she hissed. I entered the laundry and stood beside the large vat with the fire crackling beneath it. And then the idea came to me. I knew what to do with my stockings. I burned them to ashes. I felt like Alice after a bite of magic cake, as large as the entire room. When the nun saw my bare legs, she exploded. Margaret, put on your stockings, she demanded. I set my jaw and crossed my arms. I can't. Why not? I just can't. Her face grew very red and she ordered everyone to search the room. Like the queen's henchmen in my book, they scurried around, upturning everything. Books were torn from shelves and blankets from beds. No one was calling me fatty legs now, and no amount of searching could ever bring those stockings back. The nun snarled when I was allowed another pair. In my new thick gray stockings, I felt victorious. But when I strode into class the next day, the nun slammed a book on my desk. It was a green reader, like the older girls used. Page 34, she said. She wanted to cut me down to size. I opened the book, nervousness swelling in my throat. I looked at the words and began slowly twisting my tongue around the consonants and forming my mouth around the vowels. By the second paragraph, I confidently sliced through the words without a single moment of hesitation. There was no one stopping. When I finished, I looked up, but the nun was facing the blackboard. Sit down, Margaret, she said. I felt a great happiness inside that I dared not show. I quietly took my seat. I was Oliman, conqueror of evil, reader of books. I was a girl who traveled to a strange and faraway land to stand against a tyrant like Alice. 
And like Alice, I was brave, clever, and as unyielding as the strong stone that sharpens an ulu. I finally knew this, like I knew many things, because now I could read. So little Olimon here, very, very brave little girl, even though she faced a lot of very despicable circumstances, she was very strong. I appreciate hearing about that wonderful story from Christy and Margaret. Thank you for sharing that story with us. It gives us a better understanding of many things that a lot of us still do not understand. The second book we are going to be reading today is called I'm Finding My Talk with words by Rebecca Thomas and art by Pauline Young. Now here on the back, we can learn a little bit more about the artists for this book. So Rebecca Thomas, the author, is an award-winning Mi'kmaq poet. She is Halifax's former poet laureate, 2016 to 2018, and has been published in multiple journals and magazines. She coordinated the Halifax Slam Poetry Team from 2014 to 2017, leading them to three national competitions with the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word. I'm Finding My Talk is her first book. Now, this book is illustrated by Pauline Young. Pauline Young is a visual artist who was first exposed to the creative world through her father, Philip Young, an internationally renowned artist who painted the bottoms of her feet. She still recalls the smooth sensation of paint oozing between her toes. She draws her inspiration from him and the natural environment, and is always looking down to see what the ground can offer, such as incorporating beach sand and red oxide sand into her paintings. Now, let's see. This story is all about. You see there's some beautiful orange in here. I'm wearing an orange shirt as well. Sometimes people will wear orange shirts in solidarity for all of the children, both who perished and those who survived the residential schools. On September 30th, that is Orange Shirt Day, and a lot of people will wear the orange shirts at once. Okay. I'm finding my talk, the one I never had, the one that the schools took away from my dad. I'm finding my talk, one word at a time. Kwe, Willalen, Namultes. Sometimes they're very old. Sometimes they rhyme. I'm finding my talk when I'm up on the stage telling big stories or squibbling words on a page. I'm finding my talk. I'm meeting my family. I'm making new friends who chose to love me. I'm finding my talk with clumsy feet that pat down the grass with every drum beat. I'm finding my talk with every bead. My regalia speaks through each stitch and seam. I'm finding my talk. It's in my smudge bowl when the smoke curls around me and makes me whole. I'm finding my talk, how it's written across the land, learning to take only what I need. The Dogulimbic helps me understand. I'm finding my talk through my community, from elders to kids. This world is still new to me. I'm finding my talk by speaking to my father, by loving him, by being his daughter. I'm finding my talk by speaking with my sister, knowing we're different, and I miss her. I'm finding my talk through my nephews and nieces, teaching them they are complete with all their different pieces. I'm finding my talk, it's on the inside. It's how I see the world through not one, but two eyes. I'm finding my talk, and it may take some time, but I'm learning to speak in a language that's mine. And here we have a little bit more information about the author of this book, Rebecca Thomas. Rebecca Thomas grew up off reserve and outside of her culture. Her father went to residential school and had a hard time teaching Rebecca about her culture because he didn't remember very much about it. 
He couldn't speak his language anymore, and because of that, he couldn't reach, teach Rebecca how to speak it either. Rebecca was in her 20s when she read the poem, I Lost My Talk by Rita Joe, and was struck by how much she could relate to it, even though she never spoke the language to begin with. Because not only did the Shubenacadie School take away Rita Joe's and Rebecca fa Rebecca's father's talk, they took it away from Rebecca too. While Rebecca grew up, she had to figure out what it meant to be Mi'kmaq, although without knowing any of the words from her world. But she started to learn. Rita Joe's work, in part, inspired Rebecca to use her voice to connect with other Indigenous peoples who are still figuring out who they are and how they fit into a world for which they might not know all the words. I think this is a very powerful book. It shows that even in cases where people might not be directly affected by the residential schools, there's a ripple effect. Because Rebecca's father went to residential school, he himself was very, very distanced from the very important culture. And as a result, so was Rebecca. So in this book, as you've seen, she is taking her time trying to re-identify herself with a part of her that has long since been locked away. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for sharing that story with us today, so I could share that with you. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this very special story time. And like I mentioned before, there are lots of resources here at the library if you'd like to learn more about these tragic circumstances that are occurring right now. It's hard to talk about, but we need to talk about it. We need to learn, respect, and celebrate. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.